The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Here's what I'm asking you today. I'm asking you to become all that you can be and nothing less. is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, visitors and church family. We always, always love being with you. Thank you for being here. You know, when you resist fear and doubt, you are resisting the enemy. And when you walk in love and faith, it brings victory. Thank you again for being here. We love you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. And wherever your spirit is, there's freedom. Freedom to break chains, to bring freedom, to bring life, to forgive sins, to restore families, to restore friendships and dreams and vision. And we pray for that today, Lord. Help us to become more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 6, 11 and 19 through 20. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. 
I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. the sound of the rain, from the mouth of the preacher and the sinner and sing, tender as a whisper, but loud in its refrain, may it hang on my lips for the rest of my days. There is something about the name of Jesus, it sounds like Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. We are so glad you're worshiping with us today. For over five decades, you have enabled us to reach millions of people around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our Eagle partners have been our backbone through it all. Isaiah 4031 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Regardless of our circumstances, God empowers us to lead impactful and productive lives. And there is no greater joy than giving back to Him a portion of what He gives to us. The scriptures promise that He will multiply what we offer until it overflows. 
This year, we invite you to experience the many blessings of generosity in His kingdom by becoming an Eagle Partner. The unwavering support and love of our Eagle Partners enables us to continue reaching millions of people who are seeking positive and life-changing messages because of the gospel. Because of our Eagle Partners, because of them, and they're so precious to us, our team has partnered with skilled artisans to create another Hour of Power exclusive design. Prayerfully consider becoming an Eagle Partner with your monthly gift of $50 or one-time gift of $600 and we'll send you our brand new 2024 Porcelain Eagle Statue. Created just for Hour of Power, this beautiful hand-painted collectible features an eagle with its wings spread majestically over a mountain peak overlooking the water and landscape below. This one-of-a-kind keepsake was designed to remind you that no matter where life takes you, Jesus gives you wings to soar above any earthly concerns. As a Golden Eagle partner, with your gift of $100 a month or one-time gift of $1,200, we'll send you our brand new 2024 Porcelain Eagle statue along with a wood base for display. This beautiful statue along with the elegant wood base, will be a stunning addition to your home or office. Call, write, or go online to become an Eagle Partner today. When you choose to partner with us in the spreading of the gospel, it empowers us to build a solid foundation from which big dreams are realized and great heights are achieved. Hey, if you've been an Eagle Partner in the past, join us again so we can keep our power alive and thriving in 2024 and beyond. And if you've never been an Eagle Partner, I really want to encourage you to partner with us today. With your support, we can continue to share God's love and hope to millions around the world. Thank you and remember as always, God loves you and so do we. Victory is a Grammy award-winning Christian music artist who not only has captivating vocals, but incredible songwriting abilities. She brings a jazzy and soulful sound to hymns that we know and love while writing new music with messages of redemption and encouragement to listeners. She recently released her new album, Glory Hour, which highlights both new songs and classic hymns. Please welcome Victory. Hi, Victory. It's fun to hear, please welcome Victory. I'm like, yes, <laughs> bring the Victory. That's yes. a cool name. That's your real name, right? It is, yeah. I love it, it's great. Um, it's cool that you won a Grammy too. Is it just like on your bed? Do you kiss it before you go to bed? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I remember learning the news that I won a Grammy. It was during COVID, so no one actually went to the Grammys. Oh, bummer. And, <laughs> oh. and um, it was like, that's great. Let's get back to life. Yeah, <laughs> that's just, cool. Congratulations. Yeah, it's amazing. But thank you. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Yeah. And that's really what's behind your music. Tell us mm -hmm. some of that. Yeah, well, um, I am from a Christian family. I was, uh, I have eight siblings. Um, I'm one of nine, and our parents uh, raised us deeply in the faith as well as deeply in music. And um, music was a way that we expressed our faith. Uh, and um, we would sing together uh, throughout the years. Our, my parents are actually founders of a choir in Detroit. Cool. And um, I grew up singing in that choir when I was, started when I was four years old. And, um, you know, the way that you're raised is one thing and then you grow up and you, you have to test and see if these principles that you learned uh, are, is it just a theory or when push comes to shove, will uh, the word of God actually sustain you? And so my personal journey in my faith uh, has evolved quite a bit from when I was a child and I gained greater convictions because of the proven work of Jesus in my life and not just because of what I've learned from my parents. Yeah, man, I love your music too. And I, I, so, some of that music, I think, you know, the talent often comes from, you know, growing up in music. Yes. You, know, you remind me, I don't even know if you know who this is, famous jazz musician from the 50s and 60s named Nina Simone, oh, all time yeah. favorite artist. Mm -hmm. And your style and energy kind of reminds me, I don't, it's not exactly oh, the same, I, but there's something about your oh, style that seems like she influenced you. Oh, absolutely. Know. Oh, that's absolutely. cool. Yes. That's great. Um, 
You have this uh, song that people love, and tell me a little bit about it. All right, and, and it's uh, on your album. Uh, you, your album's called Glory Hour. Yes. Um, and um, tell me about how you put the album together. And you, you also included a lot of classic hymns. Yeah. And uh, a lot of young artists are kind of coming back to hymns. And, you know, tell me about some of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I found that uh, the hymns are, they're like folk songs. They're, they're crafted stories a lot of times, uh, but they're filled with, with power, um, filled with conviction, and they're oftentimes filled with excellently crafted chords and poetry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, growing up singing these hymns, I used hymns as a standard for how I could write songs, uh, reaching for this high level of poetry and chordal composition uh, and, and also power, potent, potency and conviction. And so um, as I write new songs, it's never to replace the old. I think, I think we're most powerful when we, when we compound on uh, the, the efforts and the, um, the uh, contributions that saints have made before us. Yeah. It just makes us more powerful when we add, add to it going forward. And so. I feel like the hymns for like my parents and even grandparents' generation functions like a catechism. So for hundreds of years, the church grew up with catechisms in Sunday school. Yeah, yeah. So the first question for Presbyterian West, Westminster Shorter Catechism, the first one is something like, what is the chief aim of man? Mm. And the answer is, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Yeah. And so this kind of, you have these questions that go on and on, what is, you know, or Heidelberg Catechism. And I feel like the hymns incorporated that, but in songs, it was like a lot easier to remember and yeah. you're singing it as praise. Mm -hmm. but I think if we lose the catechisms and the hymns, right. a lot of times there's this depth in our theology that feels like, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't right. know. Yeah, and another thing about this album is that a lot of the songs were actually pre, like, written before the hymns because yeah. I just took Psalms straight from the scripture awesome. and then crafted melody around that. And so this album really for me was about re recognizing that it is already written. Mm -hmm. Like it takes the pressure off of me to write something that is eternally profound when Jesus has already written with his own blood the That's most right. profound thing that could ever awesome. be spoken or written. And so. Yeah, that's what this album was my effort at doing. The song you're going to sing next for us is Rejoice. It's on your new album, right? Yes. And uh, the album is called Glory Hour uh, by Victory Boyd. And I want to encourage you to get it. You can get it anywhere albums are sold. I'll probably get it on iTunes. But yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much, Victory. What a blessing you are. It. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. God Thanks for having you. me. Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. We are so glad you're worshiping with us today. For over five decades, you have enabled us to reach millions of people around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our Eagle partners have been our backbone through it all. Isaiah 4031 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Regardless of our circumstances, God empowers us to lead impactful and productive lives. And there is no greater joy than giving back to Him a portion of what He gives to us. The scriptures promise that He will multiply what we offer until it overflows. This year, we invite you to experience the many blessings of generosity in His kingdom by becoming an Eagle Partner. The unwavering support and love of our Eagle Partners enables us to continue reaching millions of people who are seeking positive and life-changing messages because of the gospel. Because of our Eagle Partners, because of them, and they're so precious to us, our team has partnered with skilled artisans to create another Hour of Power exclusive design. Prayerfully consider becoming an Eagle Partner with your monthly gift of $50 or one-time gift of $600 and we'll send you our brand new 2024 Porcelain Eagle Statue. Created just for Hour of Power, this beautiful hand-painted collectible features an eagle with its wings spread majestically over a mountain peak overlooking the water and landscape below. This one-of-a-kind keepsake was designed to remind you that no matter where life takes you, Jesus gives you wings to soar above any earthly concerns. 
As a Golden Eagle partner, with your gift of $100 a month or one-time gift of $1,200, we'll send you our brand new 2024 Porcelain Eagle statue along with a wood base for display. This beautiful statue, along with the elegant wood base, will be a stunning addition to your home or office. Call, write, or go online to become an Eagle partner today. When you choose to partner with us in the spreading of the gospel, it empowers us to build a solid foundation from which big dreams are realized and great heights are achieved. Hey, if you've been an Eagle partner in the past, join us again so we can keep our power alive and thriving in 2024 and beyond. And if you've never been an Eagle partner, I really want to encourage you to partner with us today. With your support, we can continue to share God's love and hope to millions around the world. Thank you and remember as always, God loves you and so do we. Oh 
Today we're going to talk about how to get outsized returns in life. Uh, it's not as hard as you might think. The word for disciple in Hebrew is Talmud. Everybody say Talmud. Talmud. Plural, disciples, Talmudim. Everybody say Talmudim. This is a word uh, in Hebrew, especially in Jesus' day, super heavy word. In Jesus' day, um, in Jesus' day, Talmud were people that were the best of the best. Children who grew up as Jewish kids in Galilee or Judea would grow up learning to read and write by using the Jewish Bible, mainly the Torah, the first five books. And believe it or not, most kids would go to memorize the majority of the Torah. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it's one of the hardest, some of the hardest books in the Bible. So they would memorize it. And then by the time, as they got to early teenager, like junior high, the girls would go on to help their mothers at home. Sometimes they would continue to memorize Psalms and Proverbs. And the boys, the really good ones, would continue to study Torah even more to where they got it even better. And the very best of them would then go on to memorize the rest of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And the best of those ones, the experts, could then come under the tutelage or mentoring of a rabbi. Now, the rabbis could only take on five students, no more. And when they took them on, these guys were considered the smartest, the best of the best. Disciples were serious. Remember, in English, the word disciple comes from the core word discipline. There was a seriousness about the way in which they were going to learn from the rabbi and commit to studying as a mentor mentee, right? As a protege and mentor. So rabbi and Talmud, rabbi's teacher, Talmud is disciple, very, very weighty thing. And so when Jesus, unlike other rabbis, doesn't receive uh, those students, but actually goes out and finds them, he does something kind of different. And what we see, and this is true of every time God calls somebody, whenever God calls somebody, they're working. Moses is in the field, right, taking care of the sheep. Elijah is tilling the ground. And in this case, Jesus, when he goes to call his disciples, most of them are working. We see that Peter and Andrew are fishing. We see that James and John are repairing their nets with their father. We see that Matthew is collecting taxes. And this is because a disciple is someone who is going to be committed. They're willing to do the hard work. Here's one thing we can say of what a disciple is today and what a disciple was in Jesus' day. A disciple is someone who works harder on their character than they do on their career. And when we become people, when we say character, we don't just mean our morals. We mean courage. We mean steadfastness. We mean friendliness. We mean the expression on our face. We mean uh, learning, knowledge, wisdom. We, we mean goodwill. We mean negotiation, that there are things that we learn as disciples, as students, that when we build our character, we're working harder on ourselves than we do on our jobs. And when we do that, everything else goes better. If you work harder on your character than you do on your career, your career is actually going to get better, not worse. You're going to get outsized returns on your career. And you're going to get outsized returns in your family. You're going to get outsized returns on your sleep. You're going to get good sleep. You're going to get outside returns on your health. You're going to get outside returns on your faith. And we call it putting things first, putting first things first in that order. So here's how you get outsized returns in life. You do what 99% of people won't do. I remember not long ago in the city, great city of Seattle, there was there were protests going on. And do you guys remember this Chaz, the Chaz zone, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone? At first, it was a kind of interesting thing. They were like, whoa, this is interesting. It blocked off a huge section of the city, and there was no laws, no police, nothing allowed, and sort of the people ruled the area. And at first, it kind of looked like a Laguna Beach art district or something. You know, people are making chalk drawings on the ground, and people are doing art and dance. I was like, oh, it's kind of cool. And the cameras are shooting. I'm like, oh, it's interesting. And slowly, it just got worse and worse and worse until it looked like a zombie apocalypse. Remember that? And that's when the camera stopped going because it was like, oh, this is rough. Oh, man. It's not there anymore. One of the things you would hear in those protests are, we are the 99%. That wasn't the main thing. But I remember saying it and thinking to myself, we are the 99%. I remember thinking, no, thank you. No, thank you. 
Now you say, hey, Bobby, come on, man, that's not fair. That's not what they were saying. And I say, I know, I know that's not what they were saying, but it's what I heard. You can become more than 99% of people. That's what I want to get across to you today. Not in a judgmental way, not in any way to cast down what people are fighting for or anything like this, but to simply say, your life can be bigger than 99% of people. You can experience more than 99% of people. You can love more than 99% of people. You can touch more lives than 99% of people. You can dream more and accomplish more than 99% of people. Here's what I'm asking you today. I'm asking you to become all that you can be and nothing less. Isn't it strange that of all of God's creation, every created being in the universe becomes all that it can be? How tall does a tree grow? As tall as it can. How many prey does a tiger go after? As many as it can. How far does a dolphin swim? As far as it can. Every creature grows and does and experiences as much as it's able to. It pushes itself to the limit to experience this amazing thing called life. That's what God's sinless creation does, and it's sinless. But what do we do with this unique people, human beings, we're able to do something that no other creature can do, and that is to be less than we can be, to do less than we can do, to touch fewer lives than we know we can touch, to accomplish less than we know we can accomplish. That brings us to the scripture of the morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The scripture says, and, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything. That's a very American thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> very, <laughs> very much. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. We should do what's beneficial, don't you think? I have the right to do anything. But this is now Paul talking. But I will not be mastered by anything. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Think about that for a moment. Your body carries the Spirit of God inside of it. Most of us, we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see when we see our bodies. It's too old, it's too bad, it's too ugly. It's too, we say these things to ourselves, but God doesn't say this. To God, our body is a treasure. It is a house that he adores and lives in. And everywhere this body goes, we carry within it the Holy Spirit. And there's a sort of a divine responsibility in that. That there's like, a, when a light enters a room, you enter into the room. Don't hide the light. Uh, yeah, so you're at tempers of the Holy Spirit. Who's in you? whom you've received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What's the scripture saying? You are not your own. What are you? We said it this morning. You are God's beloved treasure. When you committed your life to him, you became his and his alone. Precious to him. Special to him. His treasure, we might say in America, this is a saying we hear, he paid good money for you, All right? And what do we mean by that? We mean that he laid down the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that we could be his own treasure. You are called to a divine destiny in God's great universe. And here's something to think about. Every single person in this building will die. And when that time comes, the only thing you take with you when you leave this life is the person you become. The only thing you take with you when you leave this life is the person you become. Become all that you can be and nothing less. I've... Uh... Yeah, the scripture says, you say I have the right to do anything. But Paul says, but not everything's beneficial. Can I tell you, I have been the I have a right guy. I've been that guy. We all have, especially during COVID. I have a 
right to sit around and watch Netflix all day. No, I've been that guy. I've been that guy. We all have. We have those moments. I remember, uh, by the way, what I'm about to say next, this is for me, maybe not for you, but for me. This has just worked for me, okay? Uh, when I was the I have a right guy, I remember I uh, had a beautiful girlfriend named Hannah Presley. I like to call her, I still do, the Duchess, because her uncle was the king, Elvis. And it was true, by the way, she related to Elvis. And uh, I remember my peers, the people, many of the wise people, many of the adults in my life said, Bobby, wait to get married. Wait to get married. You know, have some fun. You know, meet other girls. And, but uh, there was one guy, older guy, who said, you are not going to do better than Hannah Presley. You better <laughs> marry her. And I took that advice, and I'm glad I did. And my life got bigger when I married. Then, when we were married, many people told us this advice. It's great that you're married. We were 21, and by the way, we just, we just celebrated our 20-year anniversary this year, so it's been great. But they, they said to us, wait, wait to have kids, travel the world, and have some fun. And we did that. We traveled the world. We did a lot of things. We had a lot of fun. But now that I've... And we waited about eight years to have kids. And this is just for me personally, but that was bad advice. I wish we would have had kids right away. Here's what having kids did for me. It stretched me in a way I needed to be stretched. It made me think of others as babies in a way I hadn't thought of others before. I used to think I was a pretty selfless person until I didn't have a choice. You can't get mad. You can't get angry at a baby when it throws up on you or pees on you. Forgive me. It's happened several times. You can't get mad at a baby when it screams. You can't get mad at a baby when it wakes you up at 3 in the morning. You just got to love it and care for it. And our house was getting small, and we didn't live in a good neighborhood. That meant, as a guy, I had to earn more money. And in order to earn more money, I had to get out there and add value to the marketplace, which means I had to become a, what, more valuable person. I had to have more skills. I had to be able to do things with my hands. In other words, in short, it forced me to become a bigger man. I wish I hadn't waited to become a bigger man. Now, you don't need to get married and have kids to become a bigger man, but you need, or a bigger woman, but you need responsibility. And sometimes when you become a teacher, when you become a mentor, when you foster, when you adopt, when you enlist, when you get a pet even, these responsibilities force us to become bigger than we are because we have to love creatures who depend on us and care for people that are looking up to us. I digress. After I became more, I looked back at who I was when I said, I have a right to sit around and just kind of do whatever, and I regret it. I wasted my time. Many of us, we have those feelings with some of the years in our lives. It's okay. There's no reason to feel shame about it. But here's what I would say to you, especially if you're younger, I did not do anything that was morally wrong. I was a moral man. I was a good person in general. And I compared myself to my friends and my peers. How foolish. They were comparing themselves to me. And we were all in a little echo chamber, and we were all the 99%. We were doing what everybody else did. We were doing what was average. We were all apathetic. Now, again, I don't want this to be judgmental. That's the worst thing that can happen. But rather to say this. Here's what Scripture says. There are two roads, and one of those roads leads to life. And the road, narrow is the way. Here's what it says specifically. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And who knows the second part? And only a few find it. Now, this passage is not talking about people who go to heaven, right? We know a lot of people go to heaven. Right now, there's two and a half billion Christians in the world today. I think all of them are going to heaven, or most of them. But two and a half billion is not a few, is it? And anyway, he doesn't say heaven. What does he say? Narrow is the way that leads to life. 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 Zoe, the life you know you were born to have. And how many find it? A few. A few. A few. All disciples are Christians. But not all Christians are disciples. If you do what 99% of people do, you get what 99% of people get. Don't say... 
hey, other, other husbands are like me, it's fine. Other wives are like me, it's fine. Don't say all the other employees do it, it's fine. Don't say all the other Christians are like me, it's fine. Is that what you want your tombstone to say? Is that what you want it to be at the end of your life? Do you want to be the mean, the average of everyone around you? Is that what you want? Do you want your tombstone to say something like this? Here lies Bobby Schuler, average. <laughs> Here lies an average husband, an average friend, an average giver, an average pastor, an average citizen, an average student, no. Now they will lie at your funeral and say that you're more than that, but don't ask your friends and family to lie. Let it be the truth. Don't make pastors like me get up at your funeral and lie. Let it be the truth. Be a 1% kind of husband or wife. Be a 1% kind of Christian. Be a, the, best, the best student, the best believer, the best giver, the best server, the best friend a person can know. You'll be glad you did. You'll never regret something like that. Paul says you have a right, and it's true. What he's saying is this. Yeah, you have a right. You have a right to be less. You have a right to sleep in. You have a right to not grow. You have a right to self-pity. You have a right to not dream. You have a right to do the easiest thing. And you have a right to be procrastinative. Is that a word? <laughs> you have a right to procrastinate. But it's expensive. Boy, is it expensive. What does it cost, you say? I'll tell you. It costs millions. Millions of what? Millions of memories. Millions of cities you never vis visited. Millions of flavors you never tasted. Millions of words you never heard. Millions of strokes of the paintbrush you never put on the canvas. Millions of notes that were never played. Millions of laughs that were never had, and millions of memories that were never made, and millions of dollars, and millions of experiences, and millions and millions and millions that were never had. And once time is gone, you don't get it back. Do today what will make your future self glad. Maybe this is the biggest problem of all. We don't see the vision for our lives in a year, even tomorrow. Think about it. Think about tomorrow when you make your decision today, and life will go better for you. Think about the end of the month when you make your decision today, and life will go better. The end of the year, the end of your life. Begin with the end in mind, and things will go better. Scripture says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Aristotle said this similar thing in a simpler way. Don't judge a man until the day he dies. Who here is dead? <laughs> Hand goes out on the back. We'll call the mark. Your life is not over. Here's what this means. Don't judge a man until the day he dies. Here's what this means. It means it's not too late for you. It means it's possible for you. It's possible. A crack addict can become a millionaire, a multimillionaire. I've seen it. A stripper can become an evangelist and a missionary. I've seen it. A man so heavy he can barely walk can become a gymnast. I've seen it. I've seen it. And nothing on the outside of these people's lives changed. No policy was passed by the government, nor was any law enacted. No boss changed. Toxic relatives didn't change. Pizza didn't get less calories. <laughs> nothing on the outside changed. Here's what changed. Something on the inside changed. They were touched. God touched them all. Touched them with a vision of who they could become. Touch them with forgiveness of sins. Touch them with the Holy Spirit. Touch them with goals and dreams. Touch them with something that forced them to get up in the morning and become something new. It's possible for you. It's possible for you. It's possible for you. It's possible. Why don't people become all they can be? Why not? Why don't people become all they can be? It's been a lot of time, years, thinking about this question. Why don't people become all they can be? 
And after hours and hours and years of praying and meditation and study, I can tell you there's two answers and it's simple. Here's the first one. They've been lied to. They've been lied to. Lied to intentionally. The kingdom of darkness is built on deception. Never lie. Always tell the truth. Don't play that game ever. They've been lied to. Don't lie to others. And here's what the lie sounds like that you've been told and I have been told throughout life by so many. It sounds something something like this. There's no opportunity for someone like you. There's no opportunity for someone from your socioeconomic background. There's no opportunity for someone like you that doesn't have an education. There's no opportunity for someone of your race There's no opportunity for someone that of your age. There's no opportunity for someone with your disability. There's no opportunity for someone with your past. Let me tell you something. There's no saint without a past and no sinner without a future. St. Augustine says this. This is is the power of God amongst us. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. It is possible for you. It is possible for you. Believe. Believe. A great story. It might be apocryphal. It was in a newspaper a hundred and some years ago. A man from Europe wanted to come to America to pursue his dream. And the ticket, the only way to get to the new world back then was by boat. So he had to buy a very expensive ticket and took a few weeks to go from Europe to the New World, saved up all he could to get this ticket, but that's all he had. He didn't have enough money for food or for anything. And so when he got on the boat, through the whole cruise across uh, the Atlantic, he would you know, secretly, in the middle of the night, go and take stuff from the trash can. When people would leave plates out, he would eat the scraps from their plates, drink some of the water, and do this type of thing. Finally, after a few weeks of this, he was still very hungry. When they finally arrived in New York, uh, one of the deckhands saw him shuffling through the trash and eating a banana. And the deckhand said, what are you doing? He said, I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm just so hungry. And he said, well, why don't you go upstairs and eat? He said, I'm out of money. I spent all of my money on the ticket. I can't afford the food. And the deckhand said, sir, don't you know The food is included. The food is included. It's included. It's been paid for. It's available. Open your eyes. It's available. Too many believers settling for scraps. Too many believers eating out of the trash can of life. Too many believers settling for less. Not you. Not today. Today's a new day for you. A new day. Go find opportunity. Go find it. It's out there waiting for you. Go find opportunity. Write down what you want. You know why you write down what you want? It's so that the devil can see it and that the Lord can see it. Now notice this. You know what you want. You've said it to yourself a hundred times. You've said it to yourself a thousand times, but you've never written it down. And now if I even ask you to pull out a pen and paper and write it down, you'll hesitate. Why? There is a seriousness to it is written. You want a thing, you write it down. Write it down. Who do you want to be? What do you want to have? Where do you want to go? What do you want to create? How do you want people to experience you? What do you want to build? What do you want to accomplish? Write it down and look at it. And watch what it does to you. A man who builds a dream builds his own life. You build your dream and your dream will build you. Go looking for opportunity. Hey, if I asked you on your way to church today, how many red cars did you see? Would you be able to tell me? Did you see a red car on your way to church? Some of you drove a red car, I'm sure. That doesn't count. Pauline, I'm looking at you. She drives a red Mustang. We used to, anyway. Now, you would say, I'm not sure if I saw a red car, or if I did, I'm not sure how many if I saw. Now, next week, I'm going to tell you, let's say I tell you, I will give you $50 for every red car you see on your way to church. (laughs) 
You're going to get here, and the average of each of you is going to be, you know how many it's going to be? 18. You're going to see 18 red cars. Now, what, what changed? You were looking for red cars. It, it's a similar thing, like when you buy a new car, you buy a new Toyota 4Runner. You think, oh, this is a great car, hardly any people have it. And then you buy it, you're driving down the street, everywhere you look, there's a white Toyota 4Runner everywhere we go. <laughs> this is called the red car theory, that you think the things aren't there because you're not looking for them. Go look for opportunity. It's all out there. And when you start, and just like when you buy a new car, when you start to take a hold of that, a hold of that opportunity, you start to go crazy and think, is everybody blind? Look at all this opportunity. It's incredible what's available to a person who looks for opportunity. Here's another great way to be, become the person you want to become, is get around good people. You want to be a good person? Get around good people. It's so simple. You want to be a fit person? Get around some fit people. You want to be a happy person? Get around some happy people. You want to be a successful person? Get around successful people. You want to be a holy person? Get around holy people. You want to feel good again? Get around people who feel good. I remember when I was in high school, we had a youth pastor, and he used to teach us this thing, and I've taught it before, and it's true. Try to be a thermostat and not a thermometer, meaning when you go into a room or you go into a group of people, make a positive change rather than being changed by the environment. But can I tell you something else that I learned from that? It's easier to be a thermometer. It's easier to get in a room full of people that are the way you want to be and just let it change you. There are many times when I was in high school, I was like, I'm the thermostat. And I go out and I leave. I'm like, oh, I was the thermometer. Oh, it was bad. No reason to try so hard. Just get around people you want to be like. Get around people who already have your desired behavior, and you'll change. So that's the first reason. You've been lied to. There's plenty of opportunity out there. There's plenty of people that want to be around you. You have a lot to offer the world. But here's the second reason people don't become all that they can be, and it's quite obvious, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard to grow. It's hard to work on yourself. It's hard to read the books. It's hard. Yeah, many of you... Life has wounded you. You've been beat up by life, and scar tissue is built around that wound. And you say, I'm healed, I'm better now, but you're, in a way, you're not. And you find yourself in a rut. You find yourself just in a rut. Refuse. Refuse the rut. Refuse it. Have contempt for that rut. Break those chains. Refuse it. It takes guts. To get out of the ruts, what my, my grandpa used to say, Dr. Schuler, And boy, is that true. It takes heart to get out of a rut. But get out. Don't stay there. Refuse the rut. Refuse it. Life will beat you. That's something you can count on. All of us in here have been punched by life. But life will either beat the strength out of you or it will beat the strength into you. It's up to you to choose. If you don't keep growing, the weeds will. That's another thing about life. If you don't keep growing, the weeds will grow around you. And you don't want that to happen. So it's hard. That's the second reason. But it's only hard until it's not hard. You ask a man who's been going to the gym for three months, what's it like going to the gym? And what does he say? It's hard. It's hard to go. And you ask a man who's been going to the gym for three years, what does he say? It's hard not to. You ask a man, a woman who's been playing piano for three months, she's just been learning, and you ask her, what's it like learning piano? And she says, it's hard. Well, you talk to somebody who's been playing piano for three years, and while they're, you're trying to talk to them, right, what do they say? It's hard not to play piano. You ask somebody who's having a quiet time every day for three months, what's it like? And they say, it's hard. If you ask somebody who's been having a quiet time every day for three years, what do they say? It's hard not to. You ask somebody who's been going to church for three months, what's it like going to church? And not this church, <laughs> other churches. It's hard. It's hard to get up in the morning. It's hard to get dressed and go to church. If you ask somebody who's been going to church for three years, what do they say? It's hard not to. And so on and so on and so on. Why? It's hard until it changes you. It's hard until you're a new person. It's hard until you look back and you can't imagine your life without the thing you got. And so, yeah, it's hard, 
until it's hard not to. And that's the hope. Last thing I'll say. Jesus says, apart from me, you could do nothing. All these dreams and things we have, here's something else we can say. With Christ, we can do anything. And many of us here are still not at peace with God. We have fond views of Christianity or of God or of religion or we like churches or whatever, but you're not at peace with God. There's no reason to live where you're not at peace with God. It's a constant gift. He's always offering his sons and daughters. Jesus Christ, his life was laid on the cross for you and for me, that we could be at peace with God. If you believe on him, you'll be saved. Now, I encourage you today to just make a decision today to follow Christ. Just, why not? Just make a decision today to become a Christian. It's a great day to become a Christian. I want to encourage you to do that. And you can just invite Christ in your heart right where you're sitting. You don't even need to pray a prayer. You can just make a choice, just as Peter did. He just dropped his nets and followed him. You can do that. Nothing's stopping you. So I want to encourage you to commit your life to Christ. If you did that today, text me the word hope to the number on the screen. We just want to pray for you and send you some materials to help you in your walk with God. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Nothing is impossible for those who believe. That's what the scripture says. Lord, I pray for fresh vision, a bigger dream on the hearts of the people under the sound of my voice. Only a few have heard this sermon today. And I pray, God, that they would find life. And I pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The preceding program was made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.